sustainable process design in 12 hierarchical steps consisting of a three-stage methodology. I'm Rafi Kulgani. I'm the, uh, the founder of PAC for Speed and also our headquarter is in Thailand. And let me introduce you to the members of the Thai office, uh, starting with, I will just say the first names, Orakoch, who is the project manager of, um, of the office in Thailand. Then Nichakon, who is uh, a process engineer, expertise in product engineering. Then Chakrapat, also a process engineer, and his expertise is in process engineering. And then Konkanuk is a software developer. And also Siripon, a software developer. So thanks to all of you for getting this uh, initiative started. As uh, you have seen from the brochure, there are six webinars. The first one is over three days. Then the, there are five others, which are one day webinars. So webinar one and two uh, are on this month. After the, the set of three webinars, today, tomorrow, and day after, uh, related to process sustainable process design in three stages. Then we have the property estimation in four simple steps on 27th of July. Then webinar three is about refrigerant design selection verification on 16th August. Webinar four is on 25th August on chemical substitution. Webinars five is a systematic and reliable chemical product design. And the final one, webinar six, is systematic and rabbit model development. In all of these uh, webinars, we also have a invited guest lecture, which you can see in the brochure. So let me start with uh, the objective of today's webinar, not today's, but the series one, two, three of uh, today, tomorrow, tomorrow, and day after webinar. The objective is to provide the participants with a clear understanding of the main features of sustainable process design with respect to how these features and related methods and tools modeling, synthesis, analysis, optimization, integration, innovation can be employed to solve practical problems in process engineering of current and future importance in a fast, efficient, and reliable way. Use of a systems approach will play an important role. More specifically, today's uh, webinar consists of uh, five sessions. The first one is a lecture that I'm giving where I will introduce the concept of sustainable process design in 12 uh, steps in three, method uh, three stage methodology. After that, I will also give a brief overview on one of the synthesis methods that is the group contribution based generate and test. Then Professor Ignacio Grossman will give a recorded lecture. It's too early for him in California now. So he sent us a specially recorded lecture. And that will be on Biosyn, Advanced Computational Tools for Process Synthesis. After that, I will again give a short presentation on another way of doing superstructure-based process synthesis using SuperO. And finally, the last hour will be on problem sol uh, solution through our special software, ProCFD, highlighting only the steps of process synthesis. For each of those, uh, each of the sessions, there will be time at the end for uh, question answer. For Professor Goss Grossman's lecture, uh, Dr. David Bernal Neira, who is a former PhD student of Professor G Grossman, has kindly agreed to join the discussion and answer any questions for me. 
So in the series uh, tomorrow and day after, we will have process design analysis stage and process innovation stage. So let me start with the big picture. We know that uh, we humans are the master of planet Earth, but the question is what we need to do to remain at the top. And one of the challenges facing us is the challenge of water, energy, food, environment, and their interactions. How do we address those challenges? That is the sustainable solution we are looking for. So the workshop highlights the relations of energy, water, food with environment and associated challenges to find sustainable solutions. And why is this a problem? Let us look at the data. The figure you see, the blue one, is the, is the population growth on Earth. And in the next, by 2050, we may reach around 10 billion people. So what does 10 billion people mean? Which means also that within the 2050, we will need six to seven times increase in the global GDP. That will require uh, five to six times increase in the production capacity for most commodities. And all of these will require more energy demand, more electricity demand, more water demand. And all the activities will increase the greenhouse gas emissions. And we can see that from data also. If you look at the food, the curve, the demand for food is increasing. If we look at the energy, the demand for energy is increasing. If we look at the water, the demand for water is increasing. If we look at the CO2 emissions, that is also increasing. What is the effect of this? And these are measured data on planet Earth going back a long time. And what we can see is that the temperature is increasing every year. And what is the consequence of this? And these are real photographs that these are the consequences of increased temperature on Earth. So we need to have urgent action. We need to slow down the glo global warming. We need to reduce the water land contamination, stop the forestry destruction, recover reuse resources, and many more. How? Webinar one, that is 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, will point out some of those steps. So with that background, let me introduce some of the concepts that I will introduce that we will use in this uh, webinar. The first one is process synthesis. As we know processes, it's the combination of unit operations that you see on the left. Some combination of unit operations will represent a process that can convert the selected raw material that we have taken to produce the desired products. And here is a simple superstructure of a flow sheet in terms of unit operations. On the left, we have, the, we have two raw materials. On the right, we have three products. And in between, for each processing step, we have different alternatives. What we want to find out in process synthesis is the optimal path. So once we have found this optimal path, the problem is not finished because we need to design each of the unit operations, do the calculations and verify that this process is actually doing what we want to do. And that is the process design that is given the process flow sheet and the conditions that the process flow sheet has to work on. We have to fill in all the other details at for example, at what temperature and pressure the reactor will operate? What about the heat exchangers? Do we need them? Compressors, uh, the distillation column, the number of stages, feed location, so on. <clears throat> With all of those details, those are the design decisions 
once we have got them, then we can do the stimulation of the process. And after the simulation, using the results, we can analyze, find out the cost, find out the environmental impact, find out operability, and then we need to continue. So having this simulation is not an end, we need the innovation also. And why we need the innovation can be looked at from the sustainability point of view. You see on the curve, on the y-axis is human progress, that is the green curve. And what you see is that at different times, different technologies were invented and before they became redundant or obsolete, a new technology took over. So the green curve could continuously go up. So that's why even if we have a process, it doesn't mean we finish there. Before that process becomes redundant, we need another process. So that brings me to the definition of a question of what is sustainability and what is sustainable development. Sustainability is the ability to sustain or the capacity to endure changes. So as you can see on the figure on the left, <clears throat> before, for example, the red technology became redundant, we have to find another way to continue. So we um, innovate and find a new technology, which is the, the black curve and then the pink curve and so on. So what is sustainable development then? We need continuous development. According to the Brundtland uh, report from 1989, it's a United Nations report. Sustainable development means development that meets the needs and aspirations of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. One has to question whether actually governments, politicians, people, business are actually following this. My observation is that we are not really following it. And so what we are doing is not really um, protecting the needs and aspirations of the future. We are compromising that. So United Nations also more recently uh, have uh, published 17 sustainable development goals. And one can see that uh, many of them have re are related to the climate action, to the clean water, sanitation, uh, energy, uh, appropriate use of energy and so on. So the question is then, which of these sustainable development goals should be satisfied? And if you look at the curve on the right, I think you're familiar now that uh, this kind of curve also is for the pandemic, the number of infections or number of deaths per time. And the light green curve is the business as usual. If we do not do anything, it will just keep on going and go above the Earth's capacity. So we need to do something and flatten the curve. And here is where chemical engineering can provide the means to find ways to flatten the curve. That's what we will see, what we can do and how we can do to flatten the curve. And here are some examples of needs leading to technological developments. On the top figure, you can see the transportation, how it has evolved. On the bottom, you can see the technology for storage of data, how it has evolved. Other examples are also very interesting. Agriculture changed the early primitive society, printing press changed the culture of people, scientific theory changed Newtonian physics to relativity and quantum physics, and personal computers and internet is having, is affecting personal and business environment. So there is a lot of examples one can see. Also, since there are lots of different ways we can do things, we need to find out which is the better ones, better alternatives that we will accept and which are the alternatives we will not accept. And in a simple diagram on the left, if we plot economic profit and environmental impact, the one 
at the bottom. This is, these are the alternatives we want. We want to make profit. At the same time, we want to have low environmental impact. And certainly, we do not want the figure on the top where we are making profit at the cost of the planet Earth. We do not want that. So again, how do we avoid having solutions at the top and look for solutions at the bottom? So then comes the question, which problems to solve? We are masters of planet Earth because we know which resources on Earth to use to make all these products that you can see in the outer circle. These are the products that sustain our modern society. But we are misusing our resources. We are uh, wasting our resources. We are in, uh, polluting the environment. So there are problems. And so we have to improve our processes, order of magnitude in order to become more sustainable. So what we need are solutions that are more prevention than cure. For example, if, if a chemical we have been using is a bad chemical and is contaminating the atmosphere, then to remove it is curing and not using it is prevention. So after a pollution has occurred, it's more difficult to address it than avoiding the pollution totally. So we are looking for prevention rather than cure. And also we can see from this uh, product tree at the bottom, we have let's say 10 raw materials that we can find on earth. And at every level up among the tree, along the tree to the leaf and the hidden fruit that we would like. If we want to go from one level to another, we need a process. And the higher we go, the product price becomes higher. The molecular size of the products, if these are chemicals based products, become bigger. The number of alternatives becomes bigger, but the production rate actually is smaller. So the lower we are, we need to produce more because the price is lower. The higher we are, we need to produce less. But which product should we make? And who should make it and where it should be made. If we all want to make the leaves and the hidden fruits, the tree may fall down because we don't have the resources anymore or we are not using the resources anymore. And who's going to make the commodity chemicals? So balance needs to be made. So what we see is that the raw materials we show these are not the only raw materials. Earth has a lot of raw materials. So the question of what to make, why to make, when to make, and how to make need to address, taking into account the location. Unfortunately, not all locations have all the resources that you see. Some have more resources than others. So the solutions we are giving are location dependent. And then we can see what is the problem we have. We know how to convert resources to products that we are very good at, but we use energy, water, et cetera, for this conversion of resources to products. And this use of energy, water, et cetera, causes environmental impacts, negative environmental impacts, and then produce waste. <clears throat> and according to several experts, like Professor Drioli, if you think of that, uh, the YouTube there is uh, taking all the resources on Earth and producing all the good products and services that we can do now. And the rest is waste. At this moment, we can only convert or get up to 25% of goods and resources and the remaining 75% is a waste. So we need order of magnitude improvement in order to improve this situation. Otherwise, we are 
going into the case of a technology going down without finding a new technology so that our sustainability curve can continue to rise. So now let's define some problems and solution approaches. The problem that we want to solve, this curve is from the IEA in 2015. What they pointed out was that if we want to keep the climate change and the global warming, all of these under control, there are different options related to power, industry, transport, buildings, other transformation uh, related to energy. But the one I'm highlighting is the industry and the brown part is the energy efficiency. This is what as chemical engineers we can do through the chemical industry, which is energy intensive. So if we can reduce this uh, brown part, by more than 50%, I think we can contribute to the solving of the problem or at least addressing the challenges very well. So we can identify the factors affecting the achievement of sustainability. The challenge is the technological solutions that must be provided within an industrial, social, uh, regulatory and ethical framework. If we look at the, at the kind of industry, I've just listed three here, the commodity chemicals, the processes that produce the commodities, the pharma bio and the food health. I will just highlight the utilities and the waste, the commodity industry, they are energy intensive, they emit CO2, there are byproducts, pharma bio, <clears throat> they're not energy intensive, but they're water intensive, they have large unused material and also water, food and uh, household. Some may use water, some may use energy, but they also have un unused material and water. So all of them have problems, but in different ways. And so the typical process design problem that we know very well convert raw materials, use utilities to pr produce products and waste. That is no longer valid. We need to establish sustainable production, adopt changing markets, survive global competition, demands for innovative products. And also we need to be sustainable, economically feasible, reduce waste, utility efficient, environmentally acceptable, safe, operable, and many more. This also means that the traditional boundary for our process analysis, which was just the process system boundary, that is not the boundary anymore. We have a bigger new system boundary, which based on which we will have to find out whether what we are doing is all right or not. We can also see from the, um, the life cycle of a product at the different stages, which kind of problem we are solving. We are actually solving the preliminary conceptual process design because at this point is where most of the important decisions are made. <clears throat> Issues one to four are fixed usually by uh, other uh, groups of people who make decisions, but then as chemical engineers, we need to find out the conceptual process design and whatever decisions we make affects steps six to 11. <clears throat> Any error in five is magnified afterwards. So it is very important that we prevent the problem rather than cure afterwards when the plant is operating. So now let me define some problems. Coming now to the process synthesis directly. So I've given an overview of um, sustainable process design, why we want to do it. Now I will just concentrate on process synthesis and tomorrow design and the day after innovation. So process synthesis is we have the raw material, we know. <clears throat> we have the product that we want to make. What we don't know is the process flow sheet. 
what process flow sheet will give us this. So let's look at a simple example of a distillation column with one feed and two products. We have a mixture, let's say, and we want the two product. We know what compositions of the two products should be. So what is the problem? So given the feed and the products that we want, we want the optimal separation of this unit operation. If it is a distillation column, we assume that distillation would be a good way to do this separation. Then we need to find out whether uh, distillation can be designed, synthesized to give us this product. The synthesis in this case is actually finding out the number of stages, the feed location, the pressure, the vapor flow, the liquid flow, the temperature, all of these. <clears throat> but we are not interested in any synthesis design. We are interested in the design that is related to the minimum cost and at the same time gives us the product we want. So we are synthesizing the distillation column in terms of number of stages, feed location, and so on. And at the same time, through optimization, we want to find the values for it. But we are not interested in any values. We are interested in the value that gives us the product we want at the cost and environmental impact that we can accept. If we put it uh, in a computational loop, we can say that if we go back here, that we will <clears throat> make a guess. We can make different pairs of guesses of variables, but let's say that we will guess the distillate rate and the reboiler duty. Then having guessed these two variables, the model will allow us to solve all the equations for the distillation column. Solving the distillation column, we will calculate the objective function. We will check if it is not at the minimum, then the optimizer will help us to find new values of the, uh, the distillate rate and reboiler duty, and we can continue. Now, this is for a fixed distillation column with number of stages and feed location and reflux ratio, et cetera. But if we also want to change those things, then we need another optimizer, not a nonlinear optimizer, but a mixed integer nonlinear optimizer that can also change the integer variables for us. So the problem can be set up differently and we need to solve it differently. So let's look at the current state of the art. Let's say that we want to find the flow sheet on the right and what we have is a process simulator. We have all the process simulators, let's say, we can use them. But process simulator actually simulates the process. It does not do the design. <clears throat> it does not do the synthesis. So how can we use the process simulator to do the synthesis? We can assume a flow sheet. Then after we have assumed the flow sheet, and added all the design parameters. Then we can do the simulation. We can evaluate the objective function. If the objective function is not what we want, if the constraints were not satisfied, then we go back to the flow sheet, go back to the design and change. So the simulator is a tool that is useful to solve problems but it does not solve the synthesis or design problem directly. It solves it iteratively. We have the inner loop where we do the simulation. We have the outer loop where we do the design synthesis decisions. Now, if we work in this way with the unit operations, then it is impossible for us to find the novel innovative solutions that we need to make an order of magnitude improvement. So the simulators have their role, that is to do the simulation. But if we use the inner outer loop to do the trial and error design synthesis, it is not going to give us the novel innovative solutions we want. Let's say here is a simple example. Let's say that we want to make benzene, we have a feed stream of benzene and hydrogen and hydrogen includes methane as impurity. 
we know that benzene and hydrogen reacts to give cyclohexane at the condition of the reactor temperature. And we want a pure product 99.9% cyclohexane. So the question is then, how can we do that? Uh, should we build a plant, look at uh, the literature and see who has built a plant? And can we just take that? Or can we take that and improve the plant? Or can we start from zero and do a totally new one? So this is the model-based problem that we want to solve. If we want to do totally new, we can also take an existing one and change, but we can see that we need a model. We need to understand the uh, thermodynamics. We need to understand which type of model we need. We need to understand how to employ the solution method and many more. Now that cyclohexane boiling point and benzene boiling point are very near to each other. So if the reaction is not 100% uh, complete and there are benzene uh, unreacted, it would be very difficult to separate benzene from cyclohexane. So one has to remember that when solving this kind of problem. So the solution approach now, we can ask the questions again. We have the raw material, we want to make the product. F is the feed flow rate of the raw material. U is the utilities that would be required. X are all the process variables and P are the product related variables. Theta are the properties. D are the design parameters. Z and W are the waste of the product and of the utilities, of the raw material and the utilities. So the question is which raw material to use, which products to make, which utilities to use, <clears throat> how many processing steps should be, how many processing step alternatives should be, all these things need to be looked at before we can say that this is a very good solution and nobody can get a better solution and it is significantly better than what we have. So we can represent this problem mathematically. We have an objective function. We have the process product model, which is equation two. We have the process product constraints, which are equation three. <clears throat> we have the equipment material constraints, how many reactor, which reactor, heat exchanger, which solvent, all those constraints. And then we have some flow sheet constraints. So all of these equations together is the general mathematical optimization problem we want to solve that will give us the synthesis solution, the design solution, the innovative solution, and so on. So the problem based on the model can be linear programming, nonlinear programming, MILP, MINLP, process simulation, and so on. How can we solve it? There are direct solution approaches. You will see also some of these in the next lecture. There's also decomposition-based approach where we don't have to solve all the equations together, but we will solve it in different parts. And, and then you can see that decision design involves both integer decisions and real process variable decisions. Why a decomposition method will work, I will show you with a simple example. Uh, as you can see that uh, the objective function is mixed integer. Equations two and three, sorry, uh, are nonlinear. Equations four and five are linear, but has uh, both integer and uh, real variables. Equation six and seven have only integers and equations eight and nine are bounds on the variables. Instead of solving with a normal MINLP solver optimizer, we can find out that equation, the group of equation uh, six and seven, which involve only integers, we can work out which combinations, these are binary integers, zero, one, <clears throat> and there are two pairs of binary integer values that satisfy equation six, seven. Then setting the values of these uh, integer variables in equations two and three, 
we find the solution of x1 and x2 and this solution is the same for both sets of y now we have two sets of solution two sets of y and one set of x we put that in equation four and five and we see that these constraints are satisfied so we have two sets of feasible solutions we calculate the objective function we check that eight and nine are also satisfied and then we find out that set two gives us the minimum objective function value and that's the optimal solution so if we can break down any problem into some hierarchical sets and we solve all those equations and satisfy all the constraints that is the basis for a decomposition based method which i will use in uh, some of the methods that i will explain so based on this we have developed a synthesis design innovation stage that are the three stage methods and in these three stages stage one is the synthesis which we will talk today stage two is the design and stage three is the innovation so that's the synthesis stage <clears throat> the design stage is uh, put in all the details on the flow sheet and uh, identify the targets for improvement through analysis and finally in the innovation stage find new alternatives that match the targets for improvement we are talking about only the heuristic uh, the synthesis stage uh, we can just say that an existing process flow sheet exists so we don't need to do anything or we can use a heuristic evolution based method we can use a superstructure based optimization method or we can also use a group contribution type method so professor grossman will talk about the superstructure optimization method i will also briefly show our way of doing it in this lecture for the re remaining period i will show the heuristic method and later i will show the group contribution method the hybrid method the tasks that need to be done is collect the data which are tasks one and two and then generate the flow sheet task four is actually process simulation so it's actually tasks one two and three so task one and two needs data collection data generation if all the data are not available and task three four includes as we said find out different ways to generate the flow sheet and do the calculation at least to make sure that uh, the flow sheet satisfies the requirement and the methods uh, are the ones that are listed heuristic generate and test mathematical programming hybrid. so now i will very quickly go through the steps of the evolutionary method that is actually developed by professor douglas and you can find it very nicely explained in his book and i will use the uh, hydro dealkylation method where toluene is converted to benzene <laughs> with hydrogen this also example will be used to demonstrate the software so according to the hierarchical douglas method there are different levels and one has to make design decisions at different levels and i will go through the different levels and answer the questions so that we can go forward and see how the design is made <clears throat> so the first level is decision related to batch continuous the flow rate of the product and so on so in order to decide whether it is batch or continuous we have these questions does any apparatus work in the batch mode is process sensitive to offsets and variations what is the production rate what is the product lifetime what is the value of the product so you can see in red i've given the answers uh, to the first one we don't know yet but we know that the production rate will be high the product lifetime will be high so it's going to be a continuous process at the second level we need to define the decisions related to input output structure which raw material to use <clears throat> how many product streams recycle streams reversible byproducts selectivity versus cost and so on so decisions that we'll, we will make, we'll fix the flow sheet, we'll fix some of the design variables, we'll fix 
some connections to the environment. The answers again for those, we can see that uh, together with hydrogen, methane comes and toluene is pure. <clears throat> methane is not very valuable compared to hydrogen. So we can say it's not valuable. We do not need to remove the methane before the reactor. We should recycle the hydrogen and impurities uh, are also products that are not, that is not the case. So the answer is there. And based on this, we go to the next one related to product. First, since there is unreacted raw material, we need to recycle the reactants. We need to remove the product. <clears throat> we need to remove the valuable byproducts. So those are yes. The conversion is not 100%, so gas will be recycled. Toluene also <clears throat> is not uh, uh, converted 100%, so toluene also will be recycled. But here, there is impurities in the gas, which is hydrogen. So we need a purge for the methane. Otherwise, we cannot have a mass balance. And so with the liquid also the same, we have toluene that needs to be recycled if 100% is not converted. So based on that, we make the decisions and this is the structure of the flow sheet now. So at every level, we start with a small and we increase and increase and increase. That's why it is an evolutionary method. So we know that after the reactor, we need to separate into a vapor product and a liquid product so we can find the liquid recycle and the vapor recycle. And also we need to recover the benzene and phenyl. So we don't know yet the separation units. So now in level three comes the decisions on recycle structure and reactor. So questions like how many reactors are needed, number of recycled streams, <clears throat> do we need pumps, do we need compressors, what is the kinetics and so on. Based on that, we will make the decisions I've given the answers and we have with these answers, we can say that we need a compressor, we need a pump, we have one reactor, but we need to add heat. So that's level three done. What we need now is uh, the separator. So for the separator, we need again to find out for the vapor recovery, how do we separate the vapor products? For the liquid recovery, how do we separate the liquid products? But we need both of them and how to locate and perform those separations. So just to show briefly the vapor recovery part, since we also have methane as impurity, should we recover hydrogen and uh, purge only methane? That also needs to be taken into account. With respect to the separations of the product, we need to find out then that out of the reactor comes four compounds, five compounds, three, <clears throat> two reactants, one inert, one main product, one byproduct. So if we want to get all five products, uh, chemicals as pure products, we need at least four separation steps. And then we need to find out at which separation step, which product will be made, will be separated. If there are azotropes, there can be problems. So we can find out whether azotropes are there. If there are no azotropes, that is fine. We remove the easiest compounds first, which is hydrogen and methane, and maybe some benzene will go. And then we need to look at the rules, recover the lightest compound first, recover the most plentiful compound first, and so on. And then based on that, we can come to the conclusion uh, using the data that distillation is a possibility. Uh, and the first distillation can remove remaining methane and hydrogen. If we put a flash before the distillation, then we will remove benzene, then we will remove toluene. And that will give us the flow sheet, which will look like this. And once we have the flow sheet, then we need to add the design and do further. So in summary, for the synthesis uh, stage, 
what I showed you first is sustainable processing. This is design analysis through a uh, <clears throat> three-stage method. We showed guaranteed improved design compared to base case that you have not seen up to now, but you will see once all the steps are done. Objective should be to obtain non-trade-off solution uh, if it is possible. That is, we don't make profit at the expense of environment or if we try to find better environmental criteria, we cannot have a infeasibly, uh, economically infeasible process. So we need to attend to both. We need to analyze that also this part has not been shown yet. Process intensification that will be in the innovation stage. Integration of methods and tools will be needed. When you see the, the demonstration, you will see that a lot of tools are needed. I've shown you already that data are needed. We need to know which model to use, even if we want to do some simple calculations and so on. The evolution method that I showed you, I only showed you the decisions and based on the decision, what is the consequence? But in order to go from one level to another, there's a lot of calculation that needs to be done. I didn't show that. Also remember that if you follow the evolutionary method at the end, you get one flow sheet. So the idea is that if you have this flow sheet, this could be considered as a reference flow sheet and then use other methods that we will discuss tomorrow to improve that flow sheet and make it more sustainable. So if we do not have any process, any information, evolutionary method is a good way to start or the methods that we will be discussing uh, after this lecture. So, and the last uh, slide uh, shows the, uh, a lot of the material that I will be covering is in the book, uh, Cedar et al book. <clears throat> and also some references uh, that I've given, and these references give references to other important uh, ones. Also in the book, there are some electronic uh, supplementary material. They are quite good uh, to follow step-by-step step the application of the method. At this point, I will stop. And if there are any questions, uh, I will be happy to answer some of them. We have still about five to 10 minutes. Okay. Um, if any participant would like to ask the questions, please click the like hand button and we will unmute it for you. And here we got two questions from our chats. The first one is, which property of the product are important to start the process synthesis? The, the properties are classified, which actually will be presented in the next lecture. Um, there are different kinds of properties. One property is related to the environment. If this chemical product is going to somehow go to the environment, what kind of effect it will have. So environmental properties need to be looked at. Then properties related to their stability, their separation, boiling point, melting point, uh, phase equilibria. There's a whole lot of list of properties that are needed and we will discuss them in the next presentation. Okay, another question? And another question is, is it possible to do process synthesis for a multi-product system in one go? For example, a new promising technology where production of various products from the same feedstock is possible? Yes, definitely it is possible. We will show with the superstructure optimization how it is possible. I can see that uh, Lucas has raised hand. Yes, um, Lucas. 
you, you, you can speak now. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for the nice presentation. And I wondered uh, in the beginning you showed um, possible ways to reduce uh, the environmental impact of the chemical in or like of the industry in general. And um, I was wondering where you would put um, things like uh, renewable, um, um, how, how to say, um, bio-based um, uh, products instead of fossil yes. fuel-based um, products. Yes, uh, actually, I mean, this, this lecture was just an introduction and only the evolutionary method. So I didn't highlight any of those things. But uh, in the lectures, remaining lectures today, and also tomorrow and day after, you will see that all these questions are answered. Ah, thank you very much. Uh, what, uh, what we are looking for is actually, that's why I mentioned the system boundary, because within the system boundary, we want to say that we will take a system boundary that includes the power supply, the energy supply, the water supply, the process, the by-process, and, and then we have to make a network of all of these options so that the net CO2 is negative. And can this solution be obtained? How to formulate these? These are things that we will discuss in actually 1.3, webinar 1.3. But the formulation of those problems will be already from 1.1 and 1.2. Okay. Any other questions? Is there any question on the chat? No, we have got only two questions. Okay, so, so then uh, we can go to the next presentation.